This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. They say there's nothing new under the sun, but what if someday Earth was flung away from our sun? So today we're going to be asking what would happen if Earth got ejected from its orbit around our sun and if we could survive in the depths of interstellar space. As we will see today, this possibility is not as unlikely as it sounds, nor as inevitable or doom as folks would tend to think, particularly from non-natural events like us intentionally moving our planet, which we will also discuss today. To begin with, there have been frequent arguments about what planets actually are for a couple centuries now which tends to interfere with the count, but while the number of objects we classify as planets might change, we generally accept that the objects themselves do not. But this isn't entirely true, and indeed if you skip back a ways, we would find the planets have changed in their number and their properties, and indeed some researchers believe that at some point in the early days, the solar system may even have had some super-Earths, planets more massive than Earth but less than Neptune, which clearly are not around anymore. We looked at those recently and how habitable they might or might not be, and our solar system would be a very different place indeed if we'd had them and had kept them, and we seem to be a bit of an anomaly in that most of the other solar systems we have gotten to look at have more mass and clutter in their planets and inner system than our own. There seems to be a tendency for systems to have one or more planets substantially more massive than Earth, orbiting closer to their sun than Mercury does, which might be an interesting topic for a Fermi Paradox episode at some point all by itself. Of course we have to keep in mind that our catalog of exoplanets is nowhere near complete or representative yet, as we mostly detect exoplanets which are either bigger or closer to their star, and especially those which are both, such as a super-Earth orbiting nearer than Mercury. There are variations on a theory kicking around, with the NICE model probably being best known, which generally say that Jupiter made an inward migration and may have ejected those planets, and did we also suspect other possible scenarios and occasions for ejecting or merging planets, but Jupiter migrating inward would certainly be a major cause. Every object exerts gravity on every other object and thus orbits get perturbed a lot when things are moving around or in unstable orbits. Stars have often passed a lot closer to our solar system than our nearest current neighbor has, and even as recently as 70,000 years ago, Schwarz's star passed through our Oort cloud in the outer solar system. Schwarz's star is actually a binary, as best as we can tell, a tiny M9.5 red dwarf, which is at the dimmest threshold of red dwarf stars, and just 9.5% of our own sun's mass, and a binary brown dwarf 6.3% of our sun's mass. While 22 light years from us now, we think they came within 0.8 light years of us, and again that was only 70,000 years ago, but not even a fifth the distance to Alpha Centauri. We expect a star passes through the Oort Cloud once every 100,000 years or so on average, and we're currently expecting the much larger Gliese 710, an orange dwarf fully 60% of our sun's mass, to pass possibly as close as a sixth of a light year away in a bit over a million years, though this still may not be the closest another star has come to us in the past, and there are maybe even closer ones to come. Events such as these have major consequences, and apart from stars we also expect things we don't see like brown dwarfs, rogue gas giants, or super-Earths to pass through with at least as much frequency as stars. Having anything pass near your delicate orbital system can have serious, permanent results, but the greatest instability comes when one object passes inside the orbit of another. As an example, if something passed by our Sun closer to it than Mars, but further from Earth, Mars would have a much higher risk of major perturbation or ejection than Earth, with the same being true if something were to pass inside Earth's orbit but outside Venus or Mercury's. They would be less affected than us, and we would probably have a very bad day. The sheer mass of both objects also makes a big difference though, so Jupiter would be less affected by an encounter with an extrasolar object even though it is far more likely that things would cross its path. And of course it also matters where the various planets are relative to the interloper's course at a given time. Now it is worth noting that a sixth of a light year is still over 10,000 AU astronomical units, 
Earth is 1 AU from the Sun, Jupiter is 5, and even distant far far out, our solar system's currently most distantly known dwarf planet, is only 132 AU away, which is barely 1% of that distance. While the Sun does yank objects toward it, for the most part, at this scale, frequency and probability tend to go with the cross-section of an orbit, or roughly the square of its distance from the Sun. So loosely speaking an object 10 times further from the Sun has 10 squared or 100 times as many objects passing between it and the Sun. That also means you would expect Earth, 5 times closer to the Sun than Jupiter, to get objects inside its orbit only 5 squared or a 25th or 4% as often. This is very approximate. In any event, while something like another star passing within those distances is somewhat improbable, were it to happen, such an event could be pretty catastrophic for us, especially if it was brighter or more massive than our Sun. The most popular video I've ever released, as of this time anyway, is our episode on colonizing Alpha Centauri, where we preface the narrative with a rogue black hole entering our solar system, with its impending approach justifying a massive colonization effort since it was expected to terribly perturb the orbits of all the planets as it passed. Echoing that, we wouldn't really be worried about a massive black hole gobbling up our solar system as it went by, but it would likely throw everything out of whack while possibly badly irradiating us from the handful of objects it managed to gorge on during its transit. Even a minor planet, of which we have around a million in the solar system alone, or an asteroid maybe 10 kilometers in diameter, if eaten by a passing black hole, could release somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 31 joules, if even 10% of its mass energy got emitted from the accretion disk it formed around that black hole. For comparison, that's all the energy released by our Sun over several hours, but all in hard gamma or x-rays instead of soft sunlight. This sort of rogue black hole on the mulch is not a terribly rare event on the galactic stage, though you need not worry about it being super likely to happen to us ever, let alone anytime soon. It is not something to be discounted either, nor more probable events like other stellar remnants, regular stars like Gly 710, or various large planets. But the massive amount of gamma radiation from that particular event is something for us to remember in a moment when discussing surviving Earth's ejection. We also shouldn't forget events like that are very likely to involve Earth being hit by other debris too, perturbed asteroids or Kuiper or Oort objects, mostly small but getting whacked by a kilometer wide comet is not something you want happening even when the sky is empty of other problems, let alone while your planet is getting irradiated, then kicked into the empty void of interstellar space. When it rains, it pours. One bit of good news is that such an event is most likely to happen from us intentionally moving Earth to another solar system, which lets us avoid the worst and do it on our own terms and with lots of prep work. I still would not consider that case super likely, but as I mentioned at the start, we will discuss that option today. How Earth gets ejected is pretty important to how well we could survive, which is part of why we discussed it in depth today and the biggest factor for survival is that prep time. We already mentioned how Gly 710 will get close to us in about a million years, and even another century of observations and modeling improvements, we could probably pin down its exact path to a tight enough window we would be able to say that there conclusively was or was not a threat and how much of a threat and what kind. It is also one option to colonize space, by seeding relative near misses, if it turns out interstellar space travel of several light years is not viable. A million years is a very long time to do some prep work, to hunker down or flee or colonize, and many might say we could just leave Earth, but I think in a case like that you would always aim to preserve your homeworld even if it meant forcibly ejecting it from a solar system yourself. Mind you, you need not do one or the other, many might flee to other worlds while others start to preserve ours. We've talked about ways of moving plants before in our Planet Ships episode, though we'll briefly review those today too. A big star coming in has a risk of wrecking the local ecology, and would also be fairly brutal on something like a Dyson Swarm, and in many ways more for the light it gives off than its mass. Smaller mass stars give off vastly less light, so it does matter because while a star ten times as massive as our Sun is obviously far more dangerous gravitationally than one a tenth of our Sun's mass, the latter is not even a thousandth as bright as our own Sun, whereas the former is several thousand times brighter than our Sun, 
and thus would be brighter in our sky than our own sun even if we were out past Pluto, where its gravitational influence on us, for all its greater mass, would still be less than a percent of our suns. Small stars are more of a concern for their gravity then, and big ones for their light, and the good news is, none of these could ever sneak up on us at this point. We should be able to see even substellar brown dwarfs or Jovians many decades before they reached us, both now and especially going forward. Black holes are dangerous because we might not see them coming. Black holes are not common, only around one in a million stars is big enough to form one, and since big stars often form, live, and die in relatively tight clusters of other big stars, many merge with neighbors or get ejected from the galaxy. However, plenty do not and can cross our path at tens of kilometers per second, and ejected ones would often be moving even faster, potentially more than a thousand kilometers per second. Now, black holes really are not black, there's always some dust circling around one in at least a weak accretion disk, especially if it's moving through interstellar medium, but it might be very hard to see one even a few light years away. We would absolutely notice the gravity of it by then though, except the faster it goes the less time it has to be pulling on stars and letting us visibly see the big shift, especially given that it wouldn't be that big of a shift. Though we might also see it by its gravitational lensing of the background behind it. Given time, we would be able to see even minor shifts around stars hundreds of light years away that would warn us to look closer, but right now I am not sure if we would detect a black hole even a light year from us, especially a fast one, and if it were moving a thousand kilometers per second, well then it might only be a few centuries away. This to me is the most probable scenario for a sneak up ejection and still gives us plenty of time. We can imagine some scenarios that might be even less, but I should note that if Earth got ejected out of the solar system, it would still take many months before Earth was getting too cold and dim for agriculture, and even longer before surface operations became non-viable. Your only realistic scenario for a sudden unworn separation of Earth and the Sun would be if a wormhole popped up next to it or inside one of them, and I am pretty skeptical if wormholes can even exist, so we will assume nobody is waking up to an eternally black sky as a surprise. What would we do if we did though, die? Well, no. Even in this most extreme case, and with current technology, we should be able to salvage a remnant of humanity able to live for many millennia. We talked about such an emergency protocol some months back, and in that you probably get your people working on deep underground bunkers powered by nuclear energy, and also big freezer tombs for everyone else gambling you have restorative technologies for them down the road, to revive them from cryo. Now what actually is happening to eject a planet? Uh, There's a number of different methods, as an example close binary systems where you have planets orbiting both stars, called circumbinary, have a region of instability around them called step, stellar tidal evolution of planets. It is a bit hard to explain how the ejection process works in general terms for cases where the ejection is evolving over a long time not a near-miss of a big object passing through once. It is much like how we use gravitational force to tow a planet. There is a little extra force being exerted on the body to be ejected, and it's not negating out in terms of its orbiting the star or primary, as this happens with moons around planets too. As an example, one way we can move Earth from the Sun is by moving the Moon, which is easier and safer to shove on with its lack of atmosphere or people. The Moon tugs on Earth with the same force Earth tugs on the Moon, so move the Moon and that influence shifts. The Moon has one side always facing Earth and another faced away, and there's a point on each side that is the closest and furthest from Earth. Let's say I kick the Moon. If I detonate a big bomb on the Earth side of the Moon, at the closest point, then do the same on the far other side, that explosion will push the Moon a bit away from Earth and the second will shove it a bit back toward Earth. But if I detonate the bomb on the light side when the moon is full, when it's on the other side of Earth from the sun, it will move a bit away from the sun, then I detonate the far side bomb on the new moon, where the moon is roughly between the sun and Earth. That push will also shove the moon away from Earth, but will correct the moon's orbit around Earth. Hence the Earth-Moon system is unchanged, but shoved two bomb blasts away from the sun. Not a lot by the way, the entire kinetic energy of the Earth-Moon system, around the Sun, 
is about 3 times 10 to the 33 joules, whereas a megaton H-bomb is around 4 times 10 to the 15th joules, or a billion billion times weaker. Gravitational potential energy of a satellite goes with the inverse square root of the radius, and thus is only shoving the Earth about a trillionth of a trillionth of a meter further from the Sun. So don't worry about bomb tests or rocket launches on Earth or the Moon blowing us away into deep space. Indeed, we get far more shoved just from the solar wind and light pressure of the Sun, and it can still be mostly disregarded as an effect on Earth. Mind you, it's a lot different if you start covering the Moon's surface with mirrors and directing stilazo pushing beams on it, again see our Planet Ships episode for more on that. If we reverse our detonations, blowing the bombs on the close and far side of the Moon, during the New Moon and Full Moon respectively instead, the Earth-Moon system would move toward the Sun. This is also how the reflective mirrors around stars in a Shikata thruster system work, allowing you to enclose a star with mirrors orbiting it and use those to let that star's light push them and the star is tugged along by that, and are what we call gravity tractors, where we shove one object and it gravitationally pulls on another. However, that basic method of uneven force of the Moon on Earth to slowly pull it free is our conceptual example of what's happening as tidal evolution ejects a planet. Something is usually pulling on a planet in a changing way in terms of both force and direction and it doesn't average or net out to zero. And that's exactly what Jupiter does to Earth for instance. Do not be under the impression our solar system is actually stable. We even have a 405,000 year orbital and climatic dual cycle of pulls on Earth by Jupiter, the biggest planet, and Venus, our nearest neighbor and more massive than Mars and Mercury combined. Fundamentally, you are looking at a sequence of uneven tugs slowly altering a planet's orbit. That sort of tugging is vastly exacerbated as objects get closer to or in the packed interior of a solar system, so two closely circling stars of non-equal mass that are on an elliptical orbit with a planet orbiting them both on an ellipse itself and not actually on the same orbital plane just close can get all sorts of uneven tugs rather than a nice central one that makes for clean orbital paths. Orbital star systems, like ours, would tend to be low on strongly perturbing orbits, not because they were rare, but because after billions of orbital cycles the more erratic ones have all been eliminated. These strong gravitational tugs would not be that extreme on the planet itself though, which is why gravity tractors are usually considered the preferred way to move planets. However, a single or short cycle of tugs can be worse. You would need something on an order of 10 to the 33 to 10 to the 34 joules of energy to be dumped into Earth to move it and eject it, and if that was happening over a year, then we're talking something like an average power exerted on our planet of 10 to the 26 watts, similar to the power output of our Sun, of which we need to receive less than a billionth to stay warm. Now this is gravitational energy so it's not scorching us, directly. But keep in mind that the Earth and Moon are constantly exchanging gravitational energy or momentum, as are both with the Sun, and most of our tidal energy in the seas is coming from that, or rather the equivalent of friction or drag losses on the exchange. The Moon is shifting something like 800,000 kilometers closer or further from the Sun every month as it orbits Earth, and that potential energy change relative to the Sun is on an order of about 400 the orbital energy of Earth around the Sun so it is not tiny, it is in fact huge, nearly 2% as much energy as the Sun releases as sunlight during that roughly 2 week drop, then 2 week rise as the Moon dips close to the Sun then further away. Now imagine over the course of just a few months that full energy transfer to eject Earth happened as some big celestial body plowed through the inner solar system, the term ruinous would probably be conservative, but also I would not expect this to be an end-of-life kind of scenario. It could be, as some bright yellow star plowed through, exposing our planet to more sunlight than Venus gets for a few months while dumping huge amounts of tidal energy into us, but I think it would be survivable even if it is the sort of disaster that might make dinosaurs feel lucky. A black hole passing by might be better, even though it is probably converting huge amounts of matter to hard radiation as it passes by, and might mortal our ozone layer. But if we got ejected from the solar system, that loss might not matter as much, as while interstellar space is also mortarously full of cosmic radiation, the surface won't be inhabitable much longer anyway. 
This doesn't mean the planet is dead, not even excluding technology. Even as that planet freezes over, a process of many years, we would expect deep portions of the ocean itself to remain liquid for a long time, some of them even indefinitely. The more mass of the planet, the more likely it is to retain warm pockets of water under the ice for longer, and if it had a moon and kept it, which is not guaranteed, we might lose our moon if ejected, then tidal heating might permit warmth for a very long time. Earth has been slowly cooling in its core for billions of years now, and the Moon and Earth have both been slowly ebbing each other's angular momentum away into heat for nearly as long, and neither is running dry soon, though the decaying uranium in Earth's core is diminishing too and that provides a lot of mantle heat. It is possible that if Earth got ejected, while it would freeze over, with the air itself liquefying into liquid nitrogen and oxygen, then freezing to ice, Simple life surviving on geothermal and tidal heating might persist indefinitely deep below. Either way, in a period of years to decades, the surface is going to have to be completely abandoned by humans, with a few caveats we'll get to, in favor of subterranean or submarine ones, powered by nuclear fission or hopefully something better like fusion or micro black holes. Incidentally, while it wouldn't be likely to happen on Earth, a planet could maintain an ocean that was liquid nitrogen with a thin cored atmosphere of oxygen and helium above. I'd be very skeptical about life existing there or how long that oxygen would persist as a diatomic gas. But while you really cannot have surface liquids in the absence of an atmosphere, this does not mean a rogue planet would automatically be an ice ball with no atmosphere or only a trace atmosphere. It would be very dependent on a lot of specific mass and composition issues where the planet and its moon, if it had one, were concerned. It would also take one heck of a suit to let a human walk around that surface regardless, though you might have nominally habitable zones around volcanoes too. In the grand scheme of things, that planet's core tectonics shouldn't be seriously impacted for millions of years after the ejection, minus the big shove around the ejection itself might cause. That means tectonic plates shifting and volcanoes rising, and I'm not sure what a volcano blowing through layers of frozen water, oxygen, and nitrogen looks like when it erupts. It might be an environment life could persist in, we do have some weird, and weirdly stable, volcanic ecologies already. Alright, what's life like below? Well in the short term, long before the planet has utterly frozen over, kilometers deep, Odds are good a new civilization with a new equilibrium has arrived. Probably several, given the nature of such bunker civilizations, makes trade and communication tricky. Don't assume this is a single planetary survival bunker or one poor country or something either. Post apocalyptic civilizations and those busy undergoing them are their own worst enemy, but again, remember this event did not happen overnight or without warning. Even if it had, I personally tend to gamble on humanity having a ruthlessly self-sacrificing, pragmatic streak, so I'd not be surprised if at least half the current nuclear reactors got turned into scratch survival camps even if it meant lots of voluntary suicide packs. And as I've mentioned before, you really could offer people the scenario of being put in cryo for possible future restoration, even an entire planetary population. Liquid nitrogen is cheap as dirt to produce now, let alone you pump it rather than manufacture it from frozen lakes above. Personally, I wouldn't view freezing people for future revival as terribly bad odds, but even a mostly symbolic outside chance is going to be enough for a lot of folks to be willing to cooperate and sacrifice in giving the civilization a chance at survival, and such efforts are going to work better if you're building a whole ton of survival bunkers, not one big planetary or national one. Honestly assuming you have at least a decade of warning, think more like a county or city level bunkers. We usually say that you can get about 24 million kilowatts out of a single kilogram of U-235. Most of that will be heat, not electricity, but that's okay in this case. It won't go to waste. That's enough power to run a million thousand watt appliances for one day, or a single thousand watt appliance for a million days, or 40 of them for 70 years. That should be enough to keep all the lights and heat on that a family would need for a lifetime, including lighting for underground farming or hydroponics, but even if we said that you needed 10 whole kilograms of enriched uranium per person to supply the lighting or a similar amount of thorium, we're still talking less than the price of a used car per person 
and as we discussed in our episodes on Fission and Thorium, there really is no shortage of these materials, definitely not if you had advanced wanting to make and stockpile it, and were only contemplating a civilization in the low millions rather than billions. In that case, such a civilization should be able to persist for billions of years. I would not trust those supplies to last as long for a civilization of billions, but many millennia at least. If you haven't figured out fusion by then, you've got problems and you might need to be thinking about cutting your population down. I don't mean by mass culling either, or even freezing, again you've got time. You're plotting your policies at the century scale, and you probably need to be more worried about folks trying to steal your subterranean cities, reserve stocks of power, or any other raw material that's tricky to get once a planet freezes over. Though openly invading city bunkers seems like a nightmare, so intercity relations might be limited to diplomatic conflicts, or outright nuclear exchanges which would be tricky under miles of ice. In that regard I could definitely imagine a lot of well-insulated surface outposts, They would be harder than doing an Antarctic one, but a lot easier than a moon base. Underground tunnels are an option but not for sneak attacks, I really can't imagine how you could bore or melt a tunnel without it being really obvious to everyone with seismic sensors which is kind of a given for any civilization that lives and works underground. See our Subterranean Civilizations episode for more details on actually living underground or under ice but cutting or melting tunnels for trade between various undercities seems very plausible. For that matter, on the surface, a pressurized train might be able to run on superconducting magnetic levitation just given how cold it would be there, and similarly you might use such cables, on the top or near the surface, to move electricity between undercities. Now your most heat efficient structure is a sphere but I would expect underground or under ice cities to be more insect hive like, with tons of tunnels going everywhere and most folks living in vacuum walled or aerogel lined chambers cut out of it. This is especially true as that city is rather migratory, really all cities are, they creep around the map on long timelines, but these would presumably crawl vertically too, ever deeper. It's just we're talking, especially after the first few millennia, about a very slow crawl happening on multi-generational timelines. Your big challenge is, you need to recycle your air and water where possible, and you need to get very good at producing LEDs and strong tunnel buttressing. Incidentally while a civilization with fusion, even just deuterium fusion, would have a vastly larger fuel supply, we should assume they are still underground too. It still takes a lot of effort to maintain all that power generation equipment even if the fuel is plentiful, so you are only contemplating options like relighting the entire planet via a fake sun or big sun towers if you have really good automation too, at which point your planet's circumstance represents an irritating starting point not a long term dilemma. Nor does being stuck on a frozen world in the interstellar void imply any sort of abandonment of space travel or galactic colonization. The whole planet is now a spaceship, after all. Fundamentally it's going to be easier to artificially light that planet than it would be to move it to a new star system, but you might be on a trajectory you could nudge to enter one and safely orbit. More likely you just send out colony ships to new systems and expect them to keep sharing technology and resources with you until you got to the point you could revivify your planet. I could see wards doing this to survive their own sun dying too, if they knew the red giant phase was looming, they'd begin the million year task of slowly pushing their sun away toward a carefully calculated re-entry around a new and younger star. Indeed you could do it even faster, but this strikes me as requiring the sorts of energy and efforts that would come from a post-scarcity economy and a Kardashev II civilization, just one that happens to be putting a lot of effort into moving their new homeworld. Though for them the effort would be less in relative terms than us supporting an Antarctic base like McMurdo, in such a case the lifestyle and livelihood of those on it depends a lot on their specific tech and how generous that wider civilization is when it comes to effort and resources. In a non-fusion economy, in some remnant of civilization of a few million, living in fission-powered bunkers, sort of a worst case scenario, I could imagine a big struggle between folks wanting to move on or accept fate versus those pushing for more effort to figure out a new power source or restore frozen folks if you had them. It would seem an interesting place to set a story or two in, but this is where we'll finish our tale for today. As we saw, while our sun is critical to our world's survival and we're not likely to ever be parted from it, 
if we were, we could survive, even in the eternal night of deep space under a frozen sky. Needless to say, surviving after your planet freezes over isn't going to be easy, as we saw today, but last week I was watching an episode of Catalyst over on Curiosity Stream, Poor Lor People, that was looking at how they select among applicants to work in Antarctica. There is a lot of screening, physically and psychologically, some of it surprising but logical, and combined with prepping this video, it got me wondering on some scenarios for what life might be like a century after such a cataclysm, and so we have an extended edition of today's episode over on Nebula contemplating that. Catalyst is one of my favorite shows over on Curiosity Stream, but it's just one of many shows in their collection of thousands of educational and entertaining content. Now as mentioned, we'll be having an extended edition over on Nebula to look a bit deeper at life a century after the sun disappears, and if you are interested in seeing that, or any of our other extended editions, you can try out Nebula anytime. Nebula is our streaming service created to give YouTube creators more flexibility and not be at the whim of YouTube's algorithms for our content, or any other platform. It is the largest creator-owned streaming service in existence, and all of SFIA's content is up there, ad and sponsor free, and released a couple days early. We also release an extended edition or two every month, and have some exclusive content like our Coexistence with Alien series. It's a great way to help support some of your favorite channels while getting ad-free content. Now, you can subscribe to Nebula all by itself, but we have also partnered up with Curiosity Stream, the home of thousands of great educational videos like Catalyst Portal People, to offer Nebula for free as a bonus if you sign up for Curiosity Stream using the link in our episode description. That lets you see the amazing content over on Curiosity Stream and Nebula for less than $15 a year. Just use the link in this episode's description. We contemplated today the idea of traveling between underground colonies by tunnels or surface magnetic bullet trains, and each world is going to have different and better ways of traveling, so next week we'll ask how people travel around planets once they settle there, be it hang gliding through the clouds of Venus or darting between the shadowy craters on sun-roasted Mercury. Then we'll take a look at the concept of a technological singularity, an artificial intelligence of stunning capability appearing seemingly overnight, and ask if that outcome is inevitable. And two Sundays from now we'll have our monthly livestream Q&A on April 24th, 4pm Eastern Time. After that we'll spring into May to examine the idea of alien intelligences that are so ancient and advanced they are seemingly godlike. Now, if you want to know when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button, share it with others, and leave a comment below. You can also join in the conversation on any of our social media forums, find our audio-only versions of the show, or donate to support future episodes, and all those options and more are listed in links in the episode description. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.